Podcastle. Number one. April 1st, 2008. Today's story, Come Lady Death by Peter S. Beagle. Welcome to the long-awaited first episode of PodCastle. I'm Anne Leckie, one of several hosts of PodCastle. You'll meet the others in the next few weeks. There were times along the way that we weren't sure this would ever get off the ground, but here we are, and we hope you'll have as much fun as we've been having. One of the great things about fantasy is how varied the genre is. Fairy tales, gothic stories of ghosts and curses romanticized versions of medieval Europe where magic reigns and quests and prophecies are a dime a dozen? What might be the real world except something is just off? Or the flat-out surreal? Not to mention a host of others. You could even make the argument that all fiction is a subset of fantasy fiction. How well you can make that argument is a can of worms I'm not going to open just now. But the fact remains that fantasy is an awfully wide field and PodCastle intends to bring you as many kinds of fantasy as we can find. But enough of that. You're here for the story. That would be Come Lady Death by Peter Beagle. Mr. Beagle needs no introduction. He's a Hugo and Nebula winner, and novels like The Last Unicorn and A Fine and Private Place are considered classics. Come Lady Death first appeared in the Atlantic Monthly in 1963 and has been reprinted in several other places, including the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America's Fantasy Hall of Fame. The opera The Midnight Angel, which premiered in 1993 in St. Louis, is an adaptation of Come Lady Death, with music by David Carlson and libretto by Peter Beagle himself. It was performed again in 2007 in Milwaukee. Later this year, Conlon Press will release Three Faces of the Lady, which will include Come Lady Death, an earlier version of the story, and a complete libretto of the opera. Come Lady Death is read by Paul S. Jenkins, a writer who lives in Portsmouth in the UK. He hosts The Rev Up Review, a podcast that features science fiction reviews, among other things. You can find it at www.revupreview.co.uk. He's also podcasting episodes of his first novel, The Plytone Revisionist, at paulsjenkins.net. It's said there are two inevitabilities in life, but they hardly carry the same weight, do they? It wouldn't quite be the same if the story we were about to listen to was called Come Lady Taxes. Come Lady Death by Peter S. Beagle This all happened in England a long time ago, when that George who spoke English with a heavy German accent and hated his sons was king. At that time there lived in London a lady who had nothing to do but give parties. Her name was Flora, Lady Neville, and she was a widow and very old. She lived in a great house not far from Buckingham Palace, and she had so many servants that she could not possibly remember all their names. Indeed, there were some she had never even seen. She had more food than she could eat more gowns than she could ever wear, she had wine in her cellars that no one would drink in her lifetime, and her private vaults were filled with great works of art that she did not know she owned. She spent the last years of her life giving parties and balls to which the greatest lords of England, and sometimes the king himself, came, and she was known as the wisest and wittiest woman in all London. But in time her own parties began to bore her, and though she invited the most famous people in the land— and hired the greatest jugglers and acrobats and dancers and magicians to entertain them, still she found her parties duller and duller. Listening to court gossip, which she had always loved, made her yawn. The most marvellous music, the most exciting feats of magic put her to sleep. Watching a beautiful young couple dance by her made her feel sad, and she hated to feel sad. And so, one summer afternoon, she called her closest friends around her and said to them, More and more I find that my parties entertain everyone but me. The secret of my long life is that nothing has ever been dull for me. For all my life I have been interested in everything I saw and been anxious to see more. But I cannot stand to be bored, and I will not go to parties at which I expect to be bored, especially if they are my own. Therefore, 
To my next ball I shall invite the one guest I am sure no one, not even myself, could possibly find boring. My friends, the guest of honour at my next party shall be death himself. A young poet thought this was a wonderful idea, but the rest of her friends were terrified and drew back from her. They did not want to die, they pleaded with her. Death would come for them when he was ready. Why should she invite him before the appointed hour, which would arrive soon enough? But Lady Neville said, Precisely, if death has planned to take any of us on the night of my party, he will come whether he is invited or not. But if none of us are to die, then I think it would be charming to have death among us, perhaps even to perform some little trick if he is in a good humour. And think of being able to say that we have been to a party with death. All of London will envy us, all of England. The idea began to please her friends, but a young lord, very new to London, suggested timidly, Death is so busy, suppose he has work to do and cannot accept your invitation. No one has ever refused an invitation of mine, said Lady Neville, not even the king, and the young lord was not invited to her party. She sat down then and there and wrote out the invitation. There was some dispute among her friends as to how they should address death. His lordship death seemed to place him only on the level of a viscount or a baron. His grace death met with more acceptance, but Lady Neville said it sounded hypocritical, and to refer to death as his majesty was to make him the equal of the king of England, which even Lady Neville would not dare to do. It was finally decided that all should speak of him as his eminence death, which pleased nearly everyone. Captain Compson, known both as England's most dashing cavalry officer and most elegant rake, remarked next, That's all very well, but how is the invitation to reach death? Does anyone know where he lives? Death undoubtedly lives in London, said Lady Neville, like everyone else of any importance, though he probably goes to Deauville for the summer. Actually, death must live fairly near my own house. This is much the best section of London, and you could hardly expect a person of death's importance to live anywhere else. When I stop to think of it, it's really rather strange that we haven't met before now, on the street. Most of her friends agreed with her, but the poet, whose name was David Lorimond, cried out, No, my lady, you are wrong. Death lives among the poor. Death lives in the foulest, darkest alleys of this city, in some vile, rat-ridden hovel that smells of... He stopped here, partly because Lady Neville had indicated her displeasure, and partly because he had never been inside such a hut or thought of wondering what it smelled like. Death lives among the poor, he went on, and comes to visit them every day, for he is their only friend. Lady Neville answered him as coldly as she had spoken to the young lord. He may be forced to deal with them, David, but I hardly think that he seeks them out as companions. I am certain that it is as difficult for him to think of the poor as individuals as it is for me. Death is, after all, a nobleman. There was no real argument among the lords and ladies that death lived in a neighbourhood at least as good as their own but none of them seemed to know the name of Death's Street, and no one had ever seen Death's house. If there were a war, Captain Compson said, Death would be easy to find. I have seen him, you know, even spoken to him, but he has never answered me. Quite proper, said Lady Neville. Death must always speak first. You are not a very correct person, Captain. But she smiled at him, as all women did. Then an idea came to her. My hairdresser has a sick child, I understand, she said. He was telling me about it yesterday, sounding most dull and hopeless. I will send for him and give him the invitation, and he in his turn can give it to death when he comes to take the brat. A bit unconventional, I admit, but I see no other way. If he refuses? asked a lord who had just been married. Why should he? asked Lady Neville. Again it was the poet who exclaimed amidst the general approval that it was a cruel and wicked thing to do but he fell silent when Lady Neville innocently asked him, Why, David? So the hairdresser was sent for, and when he stood before them, smiling nervously and twisting his hands to be in the same room with so many great lords, Lady Neville told him the errand that was required of him. And she was right, as she usually was, for he made no refusal. He merely took the invitation in his hand and asked to be excused. He did not return for two days, but when he did he presented himself to Lady Neville without being sent for, and handed her a small white envelope. Saying, How very nice of you, thank you very much, she opened it and found therein a plain calling card with nothing on it except these words. Death will be pleased to attend Lady Neville's ball. 
death gave you this? she asked the hairdresser eagerly. What was he like? But the hairdresser stood still, looking past her, and said nothing. And she, not really waiting for an answer, called a dozen servants to her, and told them to run and summon her friends. As she paced up and down the room, waiting for them, she asked again, What is death like? The hairdresser did not reply. When her friends came, they passed the little card excitedly from hand to hand, until it had gotten quite smudged and bent from their fingers. But they all admitted that, beyond its message, there was nothing particularly unusual about it. It was neither hot nor cold to the touch, and what little odour clung to it was rather pleasant. Everyone said that it was a very familiar smell, but no one could give it a name. The poet said that it reminded him of lilacs, but not exactly. It was Captain Compson, however, who pointed out the one thing that no one else had noticed. Look at the handwriting itself, he said. Have you ever seen anything more graceful? The letters seem as light as birds. I think we have wasted our time speaking of death as his this and his that. A woman wrote this note. Then there was an uproar and a great babble, and the card had to be handed around again so that everyone could exclaim, Yes, by God, over it. The voice of the poet rose out of the hubbub, saying, It is very natural when you come to think of it. After all, the French say, La mort, Lady Death. I should much prefer death to be a woman. Death rides a great black horse, said Captain Compson firmly, and wears armour of the same colour. Death is very tall, taller than any one. It was no woman I saw on the battlefield, striking right and left like any soldier. Perhaps the hairdresser wrote it himself, or the hairdresser's wife. But the hairdresser refused to speak, though they gathered around him and begged him to say who had given him the note. At first they promised him all sorts of rewards, and later they threatened to do terrible things to him. Did you write this card? he was asked. And who wrote it then? Was it a living woman? Was it really death? Did death say anything to you? How did you know it was death? Is death a woman? Are you trying to make fools of us all? Not a word from the hairdresser, not one word. And finally Lady Neville called her servants to have him whipped and thrown into the street. He did not look at her as they took him away, or utter a sound. Silencing her friends with a wave of her hand, Lady Neville said, The ball will take place two weeks from tonight. Let death come as death pleases, whether as a man or woman or strange sexless creature. She smiled calmly. Death may well be a woman, she said. I am less certain of death's form than I was, but I am also less frightened of death. I am too old to be afraid of anything that can use a quill pen to write me a letter. Go home now, and as you make your preparations for the ball, see that you speak of it to your servants, that they may spread the news all over London. Let it be known that on this one night no one in the world will die, for death will be dancing at Lady Neville's ball. For the next two weeks Lady Neville's great house shook and groaned and creaked like an old tree in a gale as the servants hammered and scrubbed, polished and painted, making ready for the ball. Lady Neville had always been very proud of her house, but as the ball drew near she began to be afraid that it would not be nearly grand enough for death, who was surely accustomed to visiting in the homes of richer, mightier people than herself. Fearing the scorn of death, she worked night and day supervising her servants' preparations. Curtains and carpets had to be cleaned, gold work and silverware polished until they gleamed by themselves in the dark. The grand staircase that rushed down into the ballroom like a waterfall was washed and rubbed so often that it was almost impossible to walk on it without slipping. As for the ballroom itself, it took thirty-two servants working at once to clean it properly, not counting those who were polishing the glass chandelier that was taller than a man and the fourteen smaller lamps. And when they were done, she made them do it all over, not because she saw any dust or dirt anywhere, but because she was sure that death would. As for herself, she chose her finest gown, and saw to the laundering personally. She called in another hairdresser, and had him put up her hair in the style of an earlier time, wanting to show death that she was a woman who enjoyed her age, and did not find it necessary to ape the young and beautiful. All the day of the ball she sat before her mirror, not making herself up much beyond the normal touches of rouge and eyeshadow, and fine rice powder, but staring at the lean old face she had been born with, wondering how it would appear to death. Her steward asked her to approve his wine selection, but she sent him away and stayed at her mirror until it was time to dress and go downstairs to meet her guests. Everyone arrived early. When she looked out of a window, Lady Neville saw that the driveway of her home was choked with carriages and fine horses. 
It all looks like a funeral procession, she said. The footman cried the names of her guests to the echoing ballroom. Captain Henry Compson, His Majesty's Household Cavalry. Mr. David Lorimond, Lord and Lady Torrance. They were the youngest couple there, having been married only three months before. Sir Roger Harbison. The Contessa della Candini. Lady Neville permitted them all to kiss her hand and made them welcome. She had engaged the finest musicians she could find to play for the dancing. But though they began to play at her signal, not one couple stepped out on the floor, nor did one young lord approach her to request the honour of the first dance, as was proper. They milled together, shining and murmuring, their eyes fixed on the ballroom door. Every time they heard a carriage clatter up the driveway, they seemed to flinch a little and draw closer together. Every time the footman announced the arrival of another guest, they all sighed softly and swayed a little on their feet with relief. Why did they come to my party if they were afraid? Lady Neville muttered scornfully to herself. I am not afraid of meeting death. I ask only that death may be impressed by the magnificence of my house and the flavour of my wines. I will die sooner than anyone here, but I am not afraid. Certain that death would not arrive until midnight, she moved among her guests, attempting to calm them, not with her words, which she knew they would not hear, but with the tone of her voice as if they were so many frightened horses. But little by little she herself was infected by their nervousness. Whenever she sat down she stood up again immediately. She tasted a dozen glasses of wine without finishing any of them, and she glanced constantly at her jewelled watch, at first wanting to hurry the midnight along and end the waiting later scratching at the watch-face with her forefinger, as if she would push away the night and drag the sun backward into the sky. When midnight came, she was standing with the rest of them, breathing through her mouth, shifting from foot to foot, listening for the sound of carriage wheels turning in gravel. When the clock began to strike midnight, everyone, even Lady Neville and the brave Captain Compson, gave one startled little cry and then was silent again, listening to the tolling of the clock. The smaller clocks upstairs began to chime. Lady Neville's ears hurt. She caught sight of herself in the ballroom mirror, one grey face turned up towards the ceiling as if she were gasping for air, and she thought, Death will be a woman, a hideous, filthy old crone, as tall and strong as a man, and the most terrible thing of all will be that she will have my face. All the clocks stopped striking, and Lady Neville closed her eyes. She opened them again only when she heard the whispering around her take on a different tone, one in which fear was fused with relief and a certain chagrin, for no new carriage stood in the driveway. Death had not come. The noise grew slowly louder. Here and there people were beginning to laugh. Near her, Lady Neville heard young Lord Torrance say to his wife, "'There, my darling, I told you there was nothing to be afraid of. It was all a joke.' "'I am ruined,' Lady Neville thought. The laughter was increasing. It pounded against her ears in strokes, like the chiming of the clocks. I wanted to give a ball so grand that those who were not invited would be shamed in front of the whole city, and this is my reward. I am ruined, and I deserve it. Turning to the poet Lorimond, she said, Dance with me, David. She signalled to the musicians, who at once began to play. When Lorimond hesitated, she said, Dance with me now. You will not have another chance. I shall never give a party again. Lorimond bowed and led her on to the dance floor. The guests parted for them, and the laughter died down for a moment. But Lady Neville knew that it would soon begin again. Well, let them laugh, she thought. I did not fear death when they were all trembling. Why should I fear their laughter? But she could feel a stinging at the thin lids of her eyes, and she closed them once more as she began to dance with Lorimond. And then, quite suddenly, all the carriage horses outside the house whinnied loudly, just once, as the guests had cried out at midnight. There were a great many horses, and their one salute was so loud that everyone in the room became instantly silent. They heard the heavy steps of the footman as he went to open the door, and they shivered as if they felt a cool breeze that drifted into the house. Then they heard a light voice saying, Am I late? Oh, I'm so sorry. The horses were tired and before the footman could re-enter to announce her, a lovely young girl in a white dress stepped gracefully into the ballroom doorway and stood there smiling. She could not have been more than nineteen. Her hair was yellow, and she wore it long. It fell thickly upon her bare shoulders that gleamed warmly through it, 
two limestone islands rising out of a dark golden sea. Her face was wide at the forehead and cheekbones, and narrow at the chin, and her skin was so clear that many of the ladies there, Lady Neville among them, touched their own faces wonderingly, and instantly drew their hands away as though their own skin had rasped their fingers. Her mouth was pale, where the mouths of other women were red and orange and even purple. Her eyebrows, thicker and straighter than was fashionable, met over dark, calm eyes that were set so deep in her young face and were so black, so uncompromisingly black, that the middle-aged wife of a middle-aged lord murmured, "'Touch of a gypsy there, I think.' "'Or something worse,' suggested her husband's mistress. "'Be silent!' Lady Neville spoke louder than she had intended, and the girl turned to look at her. She smiled, and Lady Neville tried to smile back, but her mouth seemed very stiff. "'Welcome,' she said. "'Welcome, my Lady Death.' A sigh rustled among the lords and ladies as the girl took the old woman's hand and curtsied to her, sinking and rising in one motion like a wave. "'You are Lady Neville,' she said. "'Thank you so much for inviting me.' Her accent was as faint and almost familiar as her perfume. "'Please excuse me for being late,' she said earnestly. "'I had to come from a long way off, and my horses are so tired.' "'The groom will rub them down,' Lady Neville said, "'and feed them if you wish.' "'Oh, no,' the girl answered quickly. "'Tell him not to go near the horses, please. "'They are not really horses, and they are very fierce.' She accepted a glass of wine from a servant and drank it slowly, sighing softly and contentedly. "'What good wine,' she said. "'And what a beautiful house you have.' "'Thank you,' said Lady Neville. Without turning, she could feel every woman in the room envying her, sensing it as she could always sense the approach of rain. "'I wish I lived here,' Death said in her low, sweet voice. "'I will, one day.' Then, seeing Lady Neville become as still as if she had turned to ice, she put her hand on the old woman's arm and said, "'Oh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so cruel, but I never mean to be. Please forgive me, Lady Neville, I'm not used to company, and I do such stupid things. Please forgive me.' Her hand felt as light and warm on Lady Neville's arm as the hand of any other young girl, and her eyes were so appealing that Lady Neville replied, "'You have said nothing wrong. While you are my guest, my house is yours.' "'Thank you,' said Death." and she smiled so radiantly that the musicians began to play quite by themselves, and with no sign from Lady Neville. She would have stopped them, but Death said, Oh, what lovely music! Let them play, please! So the musicians played a gavotte, and Death, unabashed by eyes that stared at her in greedy terror, sang softly to herself without words, lifted her white gown slightly with both hands, and made hesitant little patting steps with her small feet. I have not danced in so long, she said wistfully. I'm quite sure I've forgotten how. She was shy. She would not look up to embarrass the young lords, not one of whom stepped forward to dance with her. Lady Neville felt a flood of shame and sympathy, emotions she thought had withered in her years ago. Is she to be humiliated at my own ball, she thought angrily. It is because she is death. If she were the ugliest, foulest hag in all the world, they would clamour to dance with her, because they are gentlemen, and they know what is expected of them but no gentleman will dance with death, no matter how beautiful she is. She glanced sideways at David Lorimond. His face was flushed, and his hands were clasped so tightly as he stared at death that his fingers were like glass. But when Lady Neville touched his arm, he did not turn, and when she hissed, David, he pretended not to hear her. Then Captain Compson, grey-haired and handsome in his uniform, stepped out of the crowd and bowed gracefully before death. If I may have the honour, he said, "'Captain Compson,' said Death, smiling. She put her arm in his. "'I was hoping you would ask me.' This brought a frown from the older women, who did not consider it a proper thing to say. But for that Death cared not a rap. Captain Compson led her to the centre of the floor, and there they danced. Death was curiously graceless at first. She was too anxious to please her partner, and she seemed to have no notion of rhythm. The captain himself moved with the mixture of dignity and humour that Lady Neville had never seen in another man. But when he looked at her over Death's shoulder, she saw something that no one else appeared to notice, that his face and eyes were immobile with fear, and that, though he offered Death his hand with easy gallantry, he flinched slightly when she took it, and yet he danced as well as Lady Neville had ever seen him. Ah, that's what comes of having a reputation to maintain, she thought. Captain Compson, too, must do what is expected of him. 
I hope someone else will dance with her soon. But no one did. Little by little, other couples overcame their fear and slipped hurriedly out on the floor when death was looking the other way. But nobody sought to relieve Captain Compson of his beautiful partner. They danced every dance together. In time, some of the men present began to look at her with more appreciation than terror. But when she returned their glances and smiled at them, they clung to their partners as if a cold wind were threatening to blow them away. One of the few who stared at her frankly and with pleasure was young Lord Torrance, who usually danced only with his wife. Another was the poet Lorimond. Dancing with Lady Neville, he remarked to her, If she is death, what do these frightened fools think they are? If she is ugliness, what must they be? I hate their fear. It is obscene. Death and the captain danced past them at that moment, and they heard him say to her, But if that was truly you that I saw in the battle, how can you have changed so? How can you have become so lovely? Death's laughter was gay and soft. I thought that among so many beautiful people it might be better to be beautiful. I was afraid of frightening everyone and spoiling the party. They all thought she would be ugly, said Lorimon to Lady Neville. I, I knew she would be beautiful. Then why have you not danced with her? Lady Neville asked him. Are you also afraid? No, oh no, the poet answered quickly and passionately. I will ask her to dance very soon. I only want to look at her a little longer. The musicians played on and on. The dancing wore away the night as slowly as falling water wears down a cliff. It seemed to Lady Neville that no night had ever endured longer, and yet she was neither tired nor bored. She danced with every man there, except with Lord Torrance, who was dancing with his wife as if they had just met that night, and, of course, with Captain Compson. Once he lifted his hand and touched Death's golden hair very lightly. He was a striking man still, a fit partner for so beautiful a girl. But Lady Neville looked at his face each time she passed him, and realised that he was older than anyone knew. Death herself seemed younger than the youngest there. No woman at the ball danced better than she now, though it was hard for Lady Neville to remember at what point her awkwardness had given way to the liquid sweetness of her movements. She smiled and called to everyone who caught her eye, and she knew them all by name. She sang constantly, making up words to the dance tunes, nonsense words, sounds without meaning, and yet everyone strained to hear her soft voice without knowing why. And when, during a waltz, she caught up the trailing end of her gown to give her more freedom as she danced, she seemed to Lady Neville to move like a little sailing boat over a still evening sea. Lady Neville heard Lady Torrance arguing angrily with the Contessa della Candini. I don't care if she is death, she's no older than I am, she can't be. Nonsense, said the Contessa, who could not afford to be generous to any other woman. She is twenty-eight, thirty, if she is an hour. And that dress, that bridal gown she wears, really. Vile, said the woman who had come to the ball as Captain Compson's freely acknowledged mistress. Tasteless, but one should know better than to expect taste from death, I suppose. Lady Torrance looked as if she were going to cry. They are jealous of death, Lady Neville said to herself. How strange. I am not jealous of her, not in the least, and I do not fear her at all. She was very proud of herself. Then, as unbiddenly as they had begun to play, the musicians stopped. They began to put away their instruments. In the sudden shrill silence, death pulled away from Captain Compson and ran to look out of one of the tall windows, pushing the curtains apart with both hands. Look! she said, with her back turned to them. Come and look, the night is almost gone. The summer sky was still dark, and the eastern horizon was only a shade lighter than the rest of the sky, but the stars had vanished and the trees near the house were gradually becoming distinct. Death pressed her face against the window and said, so softly that the other guests could barely hear her, I must go now. No, Lady Neville said, and was not immediately aware that she had spoken. You must stay a while longer, the ball was in your honour. Please stay. Death held out both hands to her, and Lady Neville came and took them in her own. I've had a wonderful time, she said gently. You cannot possibly imagine how it feels to be actually invited to such a ball as this, because you have given them and gone to them all your life. One is like another to you, but for me it is different. Do you understand me? Lady Neville nodded silently. I will remember this night forever, Death said. Stay, Captain Compson said. Stay just a little longer. He put his hand on Death's shoulder, and she smiled and leaned her cheek against it. Dear Captain Compson, she said, 
my first real gallant. Aren't you tired of me yet? Never, he said. Please stay. Stay, said Lorimond, and he too seemed about to touch her. Stay, I want to talk to you, I want to look at you. I will dance with you if you stay. How many followers I have, Death said in wonder. She stretched her hand toward Lorimond, but he drew back from her and then flushed in shame. A soldier and a poet, how wonderful it is to be a woman. But why did you not speak to me earlier, both of you? Now it is too late, I must go. Please stay, Lady Torrance whispered. She held on to her husband's hand for courage. We think you are so beautiful, both of us do. Gracious Lady Torrance, the girl said kindly. She turned back to the window, touched it lightly, and it flew open. The cool dawn air rushed into the ballroom, fresh with rain but already smelling faintly of the London streets over which it had passed. They heard birdsong and the strange harsh nickering of death's horses. Do you want me to stay? she asked. The question was put, not to Lady Neville, nor to Captain Compson, nor to any of her admirers, but to the Contessa della Candini, who stood well back from them all, hugging her flowers to herself and humming a little song of irritation. She did not in the least want Death to stay, but she was afraid that all the other women would think her envious of Death's beauty, and so she said, Yes, of course I do. Ah, said Death, she was almost whispering, and you, she said to another woman, do you want me to stay? Do you want me to be one of your friends? Yes, said the woman, because you are beautiful and a true lady. And you, said Death to a man, and you, to a woman, and you, to another man. Do you want me to stay? And they all answered, Yes, Lady Death, we do. Do you want me, then? She cried at last to all of them. Do you want me to live among you and to be one of you, and not to be Death any more? Do you want me to visit your houses and come to all your parties? Do you want me to ride horses like yours instead of mine? Do you want me to wear the kind of dresses you wear and say the things you would say? Would one of you marry me? And would the rest of you dance at my wedding and bring gifts to my children? Is that what you want? Yes, said Lady Neville. Stay here, stay with me, stay with us. Death's voice, without becoming louder, had become clearer and older. Too old a voice, thought Lady Neville, for such a young girl. Be sure, said Death, be sure of what you want, be very sure. Do all of you want me to stay? For if one of you says to me, No, go away, then I must leave at once and never return. Be sure, do you all want me? And everyone there cried with one voice, Yes, yes, you must stay with us. You are so beautiful that we cannot let you go. We are tired, said Captain Compson. We are blind, said Lorimond, adding, especially to poetry. We are afraid, said Lord Torrance quietly, and his wife took his arm and said, Both of us. We are dull and stupid, said Lady Neville, and growing old uselessly. Stay with us, Lady Death. And then Death smiled sweetly and radiantly and took a step forward. And it was as though she had come down among them from a very great height. Very well, she said. I will stay with you. I will be Death no more. I will be a woman. The room was full of a deep sigh, although no one was seen to open his mouth. No one moved, for the golden-haired girl was death still, and her horses still whinnied for her outside. No one could look at her for long, although she was the most beautiful girl anyone there had ever seen. There is a price to pay, she said. There is always a price. Some one of you must become death in my place, for there must forever be death in the world. Will anyone choose? Will anyone here become death of his own free will? For only thus can I become a human girl. No one spoke, no one spoke at all, but they backed slowly away from her, like waves slipping back down a beach to the sea when you try to catch them. The Contessa della Candini and her friends would have crept quietly out of the door, but Death smiled at them and they stood where they were. Captain Compson opened his mouth as though he were going to declare himself, but he said nothing. Lady Neville did not move. No one said Death. She touched a flower with her finger, and it seemed to crouch and flex itself like a pleased cat. No one at all, she said. Then I must choose, and that is just, for that is the way I became Death. I never wanted to be Death, 
and it makes me so happy that you want me to become one of yourselves. I have searched a long time for people who would want me. Now I have only to choose someone to replace me, and it is done. I will choose very carefully. Oh, we were so foolish, Lady Neville said to herself. We were so foolish. But she said nothing aloud. She merely clasped her hands and stared at the young girl, thinking vaguely that if she had had a daughter, she would have been greatly pleased if she had resembled the Lady Death. The Contessa della Candini, said Death thoughtfully, and that woman gave a little squeak of terror because she could not draw her breath for a scream. But Death laughed and said, No, that would be silly. She said nothing more, but for a long time after that the Contessa burned with humiliation at not having been chosen to be Death. Not Captain Compson, murmured Death, because he is too kind to become Death, and because it would be too cruel to him. He wants to die so badly. The expression on the Captain's face did not change, but his hands began to tremble. Not Lorimond, the girl continued, because he knows so little about life, and because I like him. The poet flushed and turned white, and then turned pink again. He made as if to kneel clumsily on one knee, but instead he pulled himself erect and stood as much like Captain Compson as he could. Not the Torrances, said Death. Never Lord and Lady Torrance, for both of them care too much about another person to take any pride in being Death. But she hesitated over Lady Torrance for a while, staring at her out of her dark and curious eyes. I was your age when I became Death she said at last. I wonder what it will be like to be your age again. I have been death for so long. Lady Torrance shivered and did not speak. And at last death said quietly, Lady Neville. I am here, Lady Neville answered. I think you are the only one, said death. I choose you, Lady Neville. Again Lady Neville heard every guest sigh softly, and although her back was to them all, she knew that they were sighing in relief that neither themselves nor anyone dear to themselves had been chosen. Lady Torrance gave a little cry of protest, but Lady Neville knew that she would have cried out at whatever choice death made. She heard herself say calmly, I am honoured, but was there no one more worthy than I? Not one, said death. There is no one quite so weary of being human. No one who knows better how meaningless it is to be alive and there is no one else here with the power to treat life, and she smiled sweetly and cruelly, the life of your hairdresser's child, for instance, as the meaningless thing it is. Death has a heart, but it is forever an empty heart, and I think, Lady Neville, that your heart is like a dry riverbed, like a seashell. You will be very content as death, more so than I, for I was very young when I became death. She came toward Lady Neville, light and swaying, her deep eyes wide and full of the light of the red morning sun that was beginning to rise. The guests at the ball moved back from her, although she did not look at them, but Lady Neville clenched her hands tightly and watched Death come toward her with little dancing steps. "'We must kiss each other,' Death said. "'That is the way I became Death.' She shook her head delightedly, so that her soft hair swirled about her shoulders. "'Quickly, quickly,' she said. Oh, I cannot wait to be human again. You may not like it, Lady Neville said. She felt very calm, though she could hear her old heart pounding in her chest and feel it in the tips of her fingers. You may not like it after a while, she said. Perhaps not. Death's smile was very close to her now. I will not be as beautiful as I am, and perhaps people will not love me as much as they do now. But I will be human for a while, and at last I will die. I have done my penance. What penance? The old woman asked the beautiful girl. What was it you did? Why did you become death? I don't remember, said the Lady Death. And you too will forget in time. She was smaller than Lady Neville, and so much younger. In her white dress she might have been the daughter that Lady Neville had never had, who would have been with her always and held her mother's head lightly in the crook of her arm when she felt old and sad. Now she lifted her head to kiss Lady Neville's cheek, and as she did so she whispered in her ear, You will still be beautiful when I am ugly. Be kind to me then. Behind Lady Neville the handsome gentlemen and ladies murmured and sighed, fluttering like moths in their evening dress, in their elegant gowns. I promise, she said, and then she pursed her dry lips to kiss the soft, sweet-smelling cheek of the young Lady Death.
Podcastle is a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and is distributed on a Creative Commons attribution non-commercial license. Share it, but don't change it or sell it. Our theme music is by Shiva in Exile. You can find them at magnatune.com. You can discuss this episode of Podcastle or nearly anything else in our forums. Just visit forum.escapeartists.info. And if you enjoyed this episode, tell a friend or post to your blog about it or consider donating via the PayPal link on our site. Terry Pratchett said, Fantasy is an exercise bicycle for the mind. It might not take you anywhere, but it tones up the muscles that can.